Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Chef Jesper Jonsson, a chef with over 37 years in the culinary industry, and is currently a chef instructor at the Augusta Scoffier School of Culinary Arts in Boulder, Colorado. At age 12, Jesper moved to the south of France from Denmark, where he received his formal culinary education and training. His experience as a private chef in numerous countries, including France, Denmark, Switzerland, Italy, and right here in the United States. Jesper has also received the Disciples de Escoffier Award and is a former board member of the American Culinary Federation. Join us today as we chat with Chef Jesper about his experience in the European culinary industry, being a private chef, life as a chef instructor, and the value of culinary education. Guten Morgen, Chef. Alles, alles in Ordnung? Guten Morgen, ja, alles in Ordnung, danke. <laughs> That's looking? the extent of my German. Is that it? That's all I get? Okay. <laughs> That's okay. all you get. <laughs> it's good to see you, buddy. I appreciate you being here today. Likewise. Hey, I have to start. Um, so many folks that, uh, particularly chefs that, uh, that we speak with, have this... Uh, this love for speed, this need for speed. So it's either a motorcycle, it's music, it's both, right? And am I correct in understanding that this European chef in front of me is an avid Jeep aficionado? <laughs> are, you yes. a, are you a Jeep fan? You're up in the mountains? Tell, tell yeah, me about we're... that. I had no idea. Yeah, we're so fortunate we live here in Colorado, so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as as gravity takes over when you get older, uh, hikes are not so exciting anymore. So jeeping makes up for it. So, um, so, so is it like a stripped down or or jacked up type of type of jeep? It, it's I would say it's moderately modified to go out and here we do primitive <laughs> rock crawling. So you're so a little humble. Bit of, you're uh, so humble. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, the need for speed has always has always been around. I. I like uh, fast cars also. So I have a Dodge Viper just to make up for, you know, when you come off the mountains and it's too slow, then we go and, and race that on the track. Oh, and, I love it. So. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love the consistency <laughs> of the need for speed. So, so in terms of elevation, sort of the, the benchmark in the state of Colorado is 14,000, right? A, a mountain that is 14,000 feet high is, is, is high, right? There's 64 of those in a Colorado, sure. I believe. Um, what altitude are you taking this Jeep up to? Well, I can tell you that there is an Escoffia sticker up at uh, Black Bear Pass and Imogene and Engineer down by Telluride, and that's uh, 12,500 feet or so. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Question answered. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be looking for the sticker anytime soon. I'll just take your word for it for sure. But I am so, I'm so happy you're here today. Um, we've known each other for a minute and um, you have a very unique background. One that, uh, that, you know, stories are written about, books are written about. So, so I'm going to try to unpeel all of it here today. I, I have a, an unbelievable appreciation for um the chefs of Europe, if you will, the cuisine of Europe, whether in Scandinavia coming down through Germany or perhaps even France and Spain. Um, so you're born in Denmark and around the age of 12 or so, you relocate to the south of France with your family. Um, did, you, did you appreciate food already as a 12 year old? And was that part of your DNA before you headed down to uh, the south of France? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Always has been. Um, I was fortunate to grow up in a household where food was was always very important. And my parents were in the fashion business. So we basically spent all vacations in France, um, okay. you know, starting okay. in Paris with some kind of fashion show or something. And then uh, it was always trying to find a restaurant with snails on the menu. Um, that was like the go to because that was usually what I was all into and my parents were all excited about having a kid eating snails and garlic butter at the age of nine ten whatever so yep so always food has always been huge in our family and the snails the escargot for, for example not not available uh, i imagine in denmark right 
No, 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 no. absolutely not. That no. and frog legs, we didn't yeah. have much of that going on. That, that that's amazing. And and so, so then then you're in the south of France, and and again, um, and I want to talk about Escoffier just for a second too. When when did you know that? I mean, your family's in the fashion business, so when did you know that? Hey, I'm 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 going to cook for a living. That's what I want to do. Um, well, so I started cooking school in at the age of 17. Okay. Um, okay. You know, graduated uh, from from middle school and and uh, and at that point, that was obviously the industry to get into in South of France. It's it's a touristy, very touristy place, um, and I've always liked food. I I cooked quite a bit before starting cooking school, and what better place than being in France and then uh, being the culinary uh, industry. Um, even, even back then I was, I was probably already sort of in my mind being ready to travel and, and see the world. And there is, not, there is no better profession to travel the world than a culinary degree. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so talk, talk to us about the south of France. Are, are, I'm trying to get the logistics. Are, are we closer to Nice or? or... Yeah. Uh, so uh, I grew up in, it's called Menton, M-E-N-T-O-N. Okay. And that is actually the border town to Italy by the Mediterranean Ocean. So um, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm so sorry that you had to it, go through it, that. Yeah. It was hard. <laughs> so the ocean, uh, the mountains on the left hand side was, was basically the ridge of those mountains where the border with Italy. Um, and then another five miles uh, west of there, that was then uh, Monaco. Um, and then from Montan to Nice is probably about 20, 25 miles. Okay. That's it. Okay. So, and then another twenty miles after that, you're in Cannes. So, uh, so Monton, Monaco, Nice, and Cannes. That was where I worked uh, the first four years that I was uh, after graduating. And then um, Villa Lulu Bay, that uh, where, where Auguste Escoffier is from, is right in that vicinity, right? Yes, that's between Nice and Cannes, sort okay. of up from a town called Antibes. It's up in the back country up there. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so, and, and it's hard to uh, imagine, well, we, we know the significance of Escoffier and his impact uh, on our profession and education and professionalism, but you actually attended a school that, that also took his name. I, I, I yes. it was part of a university, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my working in Monaco, obviously, Escoffier was hugely important since he used to be the executive chef at Hotel de Paris. And I actually, I have worked at Hotel de Paris and in the old kitchens before they remodeled it and Alain Ducasse came in. Oh so goodness. that was kind of exciting. And then also in the same ownership of, of Hotel de Paris, the SBM ownership, there's a hotel right behind it called L'Hermitage. Um, and the atrium in that hotel was actually designed by Eiffel, uh, which is in itself pretty unique. And the executive chef there was a kitchen boy when Escoffier was the executive chef. Does it give so you the chills when you even when you think about it? It's <laughs> yeah. like it's, it's 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 it's. Did you ever think that you know fast forward that you would be, you know, working working with Escoffier and and no, I carrying mean, the legacy? Yeah. You know, back then I sort of thought everybody knows Escoffier. Sure, right? sure. But yeah. but it, it was, I mean, it was true. I mean, it is a legend, right? So, um, so, so having that already as a background and sort of the foundations for what Escoffier truly means uh, was unique. Um, and then uh, in 86, there is a uh, the cooking school in Villeneuve Loubet that opened up and was named after Escoffier because of course that is that is where he was born and, and grew up and where the museum is at and uh, and that was the first year in France that there was a government by the Department of Education recognized vegetarian program and my culinary instructor that I had had for two years in in Montan was the one that started this. Uh, his name is, is uh, Montagar, a very, very uh, unique individual and has founded basically the non-GMO and, 
and vegetarian or, or uh, organization in France, if you want. And we were fortunate enough to be part of the opening of it and do all the, the beta testing of all the recipes. It was, it was absolutely amazing, incredible. In, in 2015, I had the, the great pleasure um, of accompanying uh, several online um, Escoffier students to, uh, to, to that area to visit the museum. Uh, to dine in Nice and meet with Michelle Escoffier. And um, what, what I was amazed by, and, and the locals call it Nietzsche, and, and, and it, it, it felt like the most beautiful place in the world. I, I felt like there was this Italian sort of uh, um, mix with, with French culture, like I've never seen anywhere. And I was particularly moved by the cuisine uh, heavily influenced by vegetables, also heavily influenced by the Mediterranean. So the seafood was beautiful. The bouillabaisse was like nothing I've ever experienced. Talk, talk about that culture a little bit. Uh, is, is, is it a beautiful place um, to, to live, to, to have a business, uh, to come up in the industry? Or, or was there that pressure of being <laughs> in Cannes, uh, Monaco, um, uh, lots of expectations, right, from a culinary perspective? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's no doubt that there has always been a a distinct race for Michelin stars in in south of France okay. in, in terms okay. of of cuisine. With you know, back then it was Roger Verger that was obviously the the biggest uh, uh, chef down there, but Mixed into that, uh, there is also the sort of more laid back of the southern regions, right, of, of Europe, which is, uh, I would say, definitely healthier uh, to live in there. And, and then it goes also down to simplicity. Um, you, you have yourself a drop of olive oil from, from Nice, um, and it's, it's as good as it gets. You know, mm -hmm. the, the bread is amazing. Of course, you know, the cheeses are amazing. Uh, the vegetables are incredible and you buy them every day. You go to the market every day. You pick the two zucchinis you want, the one onion that you need and the one pepper that you need for today because you're going back tomorrow. Your refrigerators at home are small because you, you, you spend time on food. Food is family, right? Family is value. And, and that's what the South of France is all, is all about. Um, and then having having the Mediterranean Ocean and the, the seafood that comes out of it is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the backland have lamb, goats, goat cheese, uh, sheep cheese, incredible, absolutely amazing. And, and then, getting, of course, not to, forget, not to forget the citrus, the citrus fruit. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, the, and the rosé, the rosé all day, right? Yeah. All day. <laughs> so, so why would someone... I mean, so you're, 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 you're through culinary school. So you're working in the region. I think you said four years. What, what motivated you to leave that area? Did you know that you wanted more or you needed experience? Were you uh, ultimately going to return or so talk about the journey a little bit. Um, I think, well, um, at, at the age of, 18 when I graduated from with my with my basic uh, training um, before doing the year in, in Villeneuve Loupé, um, I had already sort of made made a battle plan as to how I could uh, build start to build my my resume so that I could obviously move up in in the ranks, and um, and in that time, in I basically spent about six months or so, six, eight months in, in different locations. And I managed to altogether work about eight Michelin stars during those, those years. And so that I was a little bit more, uh, let's say, a, of an attractive employee to go and, and headhunt. And, um, and so far, I, I did that. I spent in those four years also two summer seasons in Copenhagen, uh, working at a, um, as it was called Alsace, the restaurant Alsace after the region in France, but it was owned by an Austrian chef. Um, but just going back home and, and working with, you know, North Atlantic seafood and, and uh, Denmark has incredible dairy products and, uh, and, and, 
quite quite interesting mushrooms etc um, and then through all these connections throughout uh, that is when I got approached for the first job uh, to move to Rome uh, in 1990 uh, and work for the Danish ambassador in Rome um, and of course that was that was pretty hard to uh, to refuse so in 1990 I packed packed my my stuff and drove five and a half hours south and ended up in Rome so some of it's serendipitous, you know, you're talented, you're, you're growing and people are noticing. Um, I think that's a great message for, for young culinarians who are listening to the show. You mentioned Alain Ducasse, Chef Ducasse um, needs no introduction. Um, around what time were, were, you, were you a young apprentice at the time that Ducasse started really making a name for himself or was he already established in the region? He, he was definitely established, uh, the name escaped me now, but he was over in jean Pin at a very infamous hotel over there, hotel, resort, restaurant over there. Okay. Um, and was definitely uh, the young chef uh, that was moving up. This was in the, in the mid, uh, mid to late 80s. Um, and when he got uh, hired on at Hotel de Paris at Louis the 15th, um, that was a very, very big change, obviously, in Monaco. Um, he was, he was, it has traditionally been, you know, other chefs moving up. That was sort of their prize was to become chef at, at the Hotel de Paris at the end. But they, they broke with traditions and, and had uh, somebody from outside the company come. And obviously, after that, that was history, right? Louis the 15th at Hotel de Paris in Monaco is, I mean, I don't think it gets any better anywhere. Talk yeah. about the jet set of the world. Yeah. So, so, so the experience is, is staggering. And, and you've worked in several countries, different cultures. What, what is life as a private chef like versus being in a, in a, in a reputable hotel or, or a freestanding restaurant? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so I, I will say that since I worked, um, I worked 12 years for the Danish foreign ministry as a, as a private chef for, for diplomats, which has definitely a lot of uh, security around it. I mean, housing, salary, a plane ticket, a plane ticket back and forth, or health insurance, right? So, um, and should something happen, obviously, you're pretty close to the guys that can help you get home because that's also what embassies do, right? So, sure. um, but the opportunity there uh, was, um, they were kind of mind blowing because they really were up to, to each individual what they would do with, with what they had. But the budgets were, were pretty, pretty large. Uh, and remember, there's no other expense, right? Everything else was taken care of. So it's exclusively food cost. And when you have $30 per person to go out and buy groceries per person, you can buy some pretty nice stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, there I thought the, the highlight of staying interesting was uh, make three course, four course meals that were, first of all, uh, balanced, uh, not repetitive, um, healthy, to a certain extent, right? Because these are people that will go out and eat lunches probably four or five times a week and the same thing for dinners. Um, and if, if you would load them up, you can very well imagine that afternoon meetings are, are, <laughs> are not going to be productive. Um, so it was well, always so, a matter so, of balancing. Some, some, of your, some of your educational training was in that area of vegetarian cooking specifically, right? A little healthier, Absolutely. a little lighter. So, it, and yep. that must have played well into you know, the creation of menus for, for diplomats, right? Absolutely. I think it's, it's very dominant in my, in my cooking today is the, the love for vegetables that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I tell all my students and everybody I've ever worked with, if you want to make a great meal, spend time on the, on the, on the, on the vegetables and the starches because the protein more or less cooks itself. Sure. Um, yeah. So, if you want to make a great dinner, it's what goes along the sort of, you know, for most people, the, the star attraction, that's what makes it a great meal. When, when you're working in an embassy for various diplomats and such, are, do you find that you're on call all the time? 
difficult to kind of start of a, a family, right? In, in that environment. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And you never quite know how long you're going to stay at a place okay. because your contract okay. is up every year. Okay. Um, now, I've always found that exciting. And, and I would say in our profession in general, if you if you have built a decent resume to begin with, you can always find a find a, a, a job or also a decent job. Right. It's not just finding a job. Um, but I. I ended up, um, I would say, with quite a few of these diplomats, actually, we became friends through the years because it oh. really is a team sport. Uh, being a being a diplomat, uh, I was very fortunate to work for uh, an ambassador, Elimagret Deloitte, that was running for head of security council at United Nations, and she won. Uh, and I mean, and that is a very very big title. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. first thing she did when she came back was shake my hands and said, "I couldn't have done it without you." Isn't so the something? power of food, the power of food to smooth every single country. Uh, definitely worked out. So that oh. was a that was a huge experience and the biggest best uh, compliment I've ever gotten. That's the that that that's an amazing story. Let let's um, let's talk a little bit about food culture, particularly in Europe, mm -hmm. right? So obviously the Scandinavian connection. You've you've cooked in France. You've you've cooked in in Italy. Um, can you take us on a little tour of? Uh, um, you know, the, 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 the commonalities and then the, you know, differences you already mentioned in, 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 in Denmark, you've got this beautiful, you know, dairy and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing, you know, walk us through a, a quick food tour, starting with your homeland. Sure. Um, and, and you cannot talk about food without talking about beverages also, right? Because that I, is I'm not going to push back together. on that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Denmark climate, you know, it has its ups and downs. Um, if you like rain, it's a great place to be with 300 days of it. Um, but it also helps tremendously with, uh, agriculture. Um, and, uh, Denmark does not have a, a very warm climate, but the, the vegetables that do grow are quite amazing. So okay. cucumbers, tomatoes are fantastic. And then of course, anything that is root vegetables grow there. We eat lots of leeks, lots of cabbage, fermented or not. Um, and then of course, just through history, there's a lot of preserving food because that is the, the old school, right? So you guys might obviously know Kravlax or smoked salmon. We also do pickled herrings, uh, and then we pickle condiments more than you can imagine. Mustards are, are a big, big, big thing, right? Uh, and then there's a lot of season, uh, seasonality in, in Denmark. And potatoes, when they're in season, they're, the skin is so thin, you can peel them just rubbing them in your, in your fingers like that. Right out uh, of in the a soil. Nice, yeah. In a yeah. nice sandy soil. Uh, those fresh boiled there with a with a sweat down onions and a cream sauce with herrings on the side. Believe it or not, take my word for it, it's pretty unique. Um, and of course, we use a lot of herbs. Uh, anything that's green you can chop, it's going to go on top of your potatoes, on top of your meats. Then there's a lot of brining going on, both in pork is a is a main protein uh, in Denmark. Uh, most cattle is used for cheese. Um, which is a huge, huge, huge industry uh, where we come from. Cream, cream products, uh, fermented uh, dairy products. There is quite a, some regions of Denmark is that's a very similar sort of sausage uh, tradition and cured meats, just like the northern part of Germany, since Denmark is landlocked with with Germany for a good part of it. Um, so with with that background and butter don't forget butter okay because that that is that was like the biggest shock moving to france when you put a piece of butter on a plate you put it a plate out on the terrace because now it's lunchtime and the butter is melted on the plate before you get to eat it we're not used to that in denmark because it doesn't get that hot um and it took my family a long time to figure out well let's try olive oil instead <laughs> because uh -oh. it's already melted <laughs> perfect lesson you know i love that exactly yeah. right yeah. Um, and then, of course, living in France after that, driving through Germany every single uh, holiday, driving and then driving back down two weeks later. Um, incredible food, obviously, there. I will, I will say of uh, 
the highlight in my book of German food is cooking wild game. I I, okay. I have I don't know anybody that can do it better. It is down to earth, just well done, um, good stuff. And then of course also Germany, right? Condiments, fermented foods, lots and lots of it. Uh, Oxenspann super, right? The oxtail soup is one of my absolute oh, memories, favorite memories, favorites, yes. right? Um, and then of course France, you know where where which is the tr the the traditions that or the techniques that we teach here. Um, I believe with a strong French uh, background in techniques. Uh, there are very few cuisines that'll that'll give you a run for your money. Um, so, and that's what we teach here at the school. And, and of course, I grew up in in that school of traditional French techniques. That's what I emphasize in teaching my students: understand your techniques and your cooking techniques and your knife cuts. And you'll notice that all of a sudden, cooking gets incredibly demystified, right? Um, I, I have, uh, I'm fortunate enough to teach the foundations classes, so the new kitchen classes. Um, and I always start out on day one by telling you in 29 days, cookbooks will no longer be guides, they will be inspirational because you know how to do every single text that is written in these cookbooks on how to, how to actually apply your cooking techniques to your food. Um, so, and and of course, the the the, the geographical uh, heritage in France and in Italy is is much much bigger than what we're used to here, right? I mean, in France, you eat certain foods in certain regions. When you're not in that region, you probably can't find that food necessarily in restaurants because it is all local produce and skill sets, um, you know, that that is linked to the geography in which you live. So when you talked earlier about being south of France and the olive oil and the vegetables and the fish and the bouillabaisse, which is a, a dish that you mentioned, you're not going to get a bouillabaisse in Lyon or in Paris because it would make absolutely no sense, right? So and 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 the, and, and and it's part of the culture. Every, every, everyone knows that. Everyone oh, yeah. knows that. The locals know it. Yeah, and they're proud. They're proud of that. Do do you sense? Yeah. Are, are we moving in that direction here in the United States as well, Chef? I don't think uh, that we are in terms of sort of history and geography. I think we are in terms of availability. Okay, okay. Um, because um, like if you're thinking about um, endives, for example, we cooked endives yesterday. To me, when I think of endives, I think of Normandy. Right. Sure, I think of, sure. of, of wrapped with boiled ham. I think of bechamel. I think of cream sauces. And of course, I can't help it. But then I think about a brie cheese because that's that region. And that is the, the sort of like the French heritage that you want, that you have. Right. Because that's that's how you think of food there. Here, if I don't think we necessarily would connect uh, a steak to Kansas or lamb to Colorado or or whatever, right? We, 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 we can find the products and make it and, and we like it. Um, you know, when I, when I think of lamb, right? I think of rosemary and thyme. I think of, of the mountains, you know, arid country uh, and what grows with that? Well, tomatoes, eggplants, zucchini, artichokes, olives, because that's what grows where they feed in South of France. So therefore those ingredients go together. So much knowledge, right? And and you said earlier it applies to beverages as well. Same thing. Cognac comes from mm -hmm. cognac, Armagnac from mm -hmm. Armagnac, Chablis from Chablis. Yep. It's just the way it champagne is. Champagne for champagne, right? Yeah. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. it's sparkling water. You have to water. end up there, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But that, but I would also say that is that is also uh, one of the things here in Colorado that is very unique for the cuisine here locally is that it is beer food. Right. There's a lot of beer food going on here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the undertone. What, what about the what about the work environment differences? So you've got culture, you've got food, you've got beverage. What, what about the work life, the work style um, from, you know, between France, let's say, and 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 Denmark? Um, there are differences, but I think also you'd be surprised by the similarities. I, I think okay. I think the I think the culinary industry is set for 
I, I think it's it, it, there's the same set of people that sort of gravitate to it, um, and and I think most chefs are, you know, most chefs are get along with other chefs very well. I think you know, uh, like-minded well, the, people. The language of the kitchen, sure, 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 yeah. and, a, and a love for the craft, um, yeah, and and the expectations for the product that we serve, right? I mean, if you take a chef sure. in Denmark or a chef in South of France, they want that plate to be perfect. And I mean, it can cause frictions like everywhere else, but I think ultimately it is the plate and the customer that drives our, uh, you know, motivation to, to always strive for more. And, uh, and I, I have seen, um, I, I think I've seen tough chefs all over the world, not tough in terms of unreasonable, but, but ambitious, tough and ambitious and and push themselves further and and quite frankly i i i think we would do ourselves an unjust or, or misjustice if we do not realize that a person on their own can get to a certain level but like-minded people that pushes each other will get better together than you will do being sort of trying on your own on your own yeah yeah that that that's that's super poignant let you know let's carry that out a little further the pandemic has obviously changed the mindset uh, of our industry right um i know a lot of uh, people entering the industry today are looking for uh, benefits they're looking for a nice healthy life work mm -hmm. balance you know interesting work that sort of thing can you speak a little of, cause you've worked in both, right? Um, perhaps pre pandemic, the, the cultural differences of working uh, as a career in Europe as a chef versus in the United States. And, and you know, my father's a, you know, uh, a Meister uh, uh, from Germany and he certainly has his, his, uh, his opinions of, of how respected the industry is in Europe. Um, like you said earlier, when you finish your, your studies, you go on a path uh, at 16, at 17, at 18. And it's, it's an incredibly respected profession in Europe, always has been. Um, I see that more and more in the United States, uh, particularly through the great work of, you know, the, the wonderful Thomas Kellers of the world, right? Danny Ballou, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And any thoughts on, 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 on the differences uh, as a profession between the United States and the Europe? Yes. Um, well, I, here you go to school to learn, to learn the, the trade of, of cooking, right? We are a trade school and, and we are very proud of what we do. And we try very hard to, to make this experience at the school, um, a preparation for the career to come. Um, in in Europe, um, there there are sort of two different models. Uh, in France, you go to to school and you work during your weekends and and the summer season in order to, you know you do your externship if you want in the summer between the two years of, of school. In Denmark, you actually do a three and a half year apprenticeship where mm -hmm. you work at a hotel uh, at a restaurant sorry for six months of the year and you go to school for six months of the year and that's the way that that works there that model works and um but the same for front of the house uh when i went to cooking school the first year we did as much front of the house as we did back of the house okay. and then in the second year that's when you then decide you're going to do one or the other um, and, and I think uh, as a chef, having also that education sort of in your bag is very, very valuable. And it has obviously proven in my private chefing or even uh, also did, uh, you know, was executive chef in a catering company to have a better understanding about the front and the back of the house, I think is, is, is very valuable. Um, but it also means that when you're in the front of the house, the front of the house staff has also gone to school for two years. Oh, sure. To yeah. Become yeah. a waiter and they're not doing it, um, you know, as a side gig to pay rent while they pursue other other avenues right here that is your profession that's what you do uh, sure, you get up sure. in the morning you go to work and you don't plan on potentially do something else down the road 
Um, so I, I think, as you said, the here in the United States, you know, everybody is a chef, right? You start cooking school in day one and, you know, everybody calls you a chef, which obviously for you and I uh, probably is a little early in your career to be called a chef, right? Sure, uh, sure. But when you graduate from a cooking school in France, you're actually proud enough to call yourself a cook. And being a cook, guys, is not is not a diminishing in any way, shape, or form. Um, I am more proud of my cooking skills than I am, if you want, on my abilities to make schedules, and and uh, you know build menus. It is when I'm on the line, I want to be a beast, right? Uh, and and I think so. So we are prouder of our education, probably there and and i would also say uh put a lot of effort into the uh, to the education i mean there's very very high expectations for you when you go through your culinary program just like we do here um over there i would say that the average level of knowledge in the kitchens with the people you work with is extremely high here you often have a knowledgeable manager, and then some of the people that you work with might have have learned per se on the line and, and not have the foundations to build on. Sure, right. and, and we're hoping Escoffier, we're striving at Escoffier to to improve that for sure. My father always says, "Strive to be a great cook for life, and everything so else will fall into place." Right. Just be a Absolutely. great, great cook for life. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, Escoffier is fortunate to have you. You you bring a wealth of experience and and insight um, and guidance for our students. And you've been with Escoffier for a long time. You've taught in the online modality. You've taught on face to face modality. Um, what's your style? What's your what's your approach to teaching? Um, I try very, very hard to make my students um, understand what the future for them can be if, if, they, if they drive it the way they, they, they could, because everybody has the same chance when they start. I try to, um, I focus my teaching on understanding what you do. For example, a carrot. Carrot is a simple orange thing, grows in the ground, not a big deal, right? Okay. But a carrot, you can eat it raw. You can peel it or not. Try to make uh, try to make chicken stock, but chicken stock. So you gotta understand that the peel and the carrot is not good. And then you can go anywhere from raw to well done, make it into a soup or a puree. Sure. Right. And that is the, the distinct advantage of every single product we use. Try to understand what you can do with every product, respect it. When is it best? And then focus on that. It can be olive oil. You know, should you finish with olive oil or should you cook with olive oil? Well, chances are if you cook it, it's not going to be as good as it was when it just came out of the bottle. So rather use it to finish, right? So if you understand the products, then all of a sudden you demystify the cooking process. If you demystify the cooking progress, you have something to build on. So learn your techniques. Don't necessarily focus on creativity quite yet. Be strong so you can be creative in the right way later. So that, that's, um, that's it. And then I, I very much try to inspire my students um, if they don't have ties, holding them back to, to go and see the world. Absolutely, I mean, pack your bags and now's the time to go. So well, so well said. Some, some of the comments um, that students have provided in their reviews of their experience and classes with you in particular include respect, knowledge, love of cooking. We can't ask for more than that. The fact that you're able to, to share that with the next generation is, is it's beautiful and it's really, really appreciated. So chef, we're, we're coming down to uh, uh, the end of our time and the name of the podcast is the ultimate dish. So 
you are well traveled, unbelievably experienced. You've probably forgotten more than most know. What is the ultimate dish? So the day I graduated from my basic two-year uh, cooking school in France, the one of the one of the people that had really inspired me to become a chef, Jean Valac was his name. He was from Honduras, and he was the first two Michelin star restaurant chef in London. Was was visiting us, and for my graduation, picked me up at noon. And we drove to the Moulin de Mougin with Roger Verger. And I had his infamous, um, we had several dishes, but we had the infamous zucchini and tomato au gratin on a, bottle, on a bed of sweated uh, onions. And his, uh, sorry, and um, Verger came out and signed a menu for me, wishing me uh, good luck in my career. Um, so that dish, the tomato and zucchini au gratin from Moulin de Mougin is the absolute superb southern dish. The ultimate dish. Absolutely ultimate beautiful. Dish. Beautifully said, Chef. Chef, thank you so much. We're so, we're so fortunate to have you at Escoffier. And like always, I'll probably see you in a little bit on campus, but uh, thank you for taking the time today. We love you and thanks again for being here. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's an honor. Absolutely. So thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.